closed. This meeting is being recorded. All right, okay, just one minute. Can you all see these slides, yeah? Uh, fine. Session two. Can you see these slides that I've put on, no? Yes. You can, yeah? Yes, yeah. Okay, so um, yesterday we did session one. So good morning, everyone. So yesterday we did session one. Good morning, uh, morning. Morning. Which was learning outcome one. Please mute yourself, everyone, before we start the session so you've got a better understanding of what we're doing. Can you all see the um, slides, yes? Hello, can you see the slides, yeah? Yes, we do. Yeah, it's oh. fine. Yeah? Okay, so just mute yourself, please. So yesterday we looked at um, learning outcome one, and we looked at uh, the communication skills um, in the health and social care environment. We looked at things like the principle of effective communication. Does anyone remember what we looked at, what kind of theories we looked at? Because we looked at some uh, different principles of effective communication. So we looked at the sender, the messenger, the receiver, and then feedback. But we also looked at different models of uh, communication. Can anyone remember, Bashara, can you remember any of the models? So Jude, can you remember any of the models that we looked at? Yeah, you. We talk about the um, you know, really model, and um, yeah, yeah, we talk about the really model and the uh, both. Yeah, Riley's model. We looked at yeah. contemporary. Um, contemporary. Yeah, contemporary model. We looked yeah. at the Aristotle's model. Let's which, well. Yeah. yeah uh, the Aristotle model was the speaker and the speech. So that speaker is the most important role. We gave yeah. some examples of Aristotle's models. Do you remember? Yeah. It's who, about who could be past speech and the audience? Yeah, but yeah. So who could it be? Could it be like a politician? Yeah, yes, politician and the trainer. Yeah, and then we looked at uh, the different types of communication briefly. We looked at verbal and uh, no, nonverbal no, no, no. Yeah, yeah within uh within the health and social care sector we also looked at things like you know signs as well and different types of language you know slang yeah, jargon yeah. Yeah, um yes. and we looked at different types of technological aids as well for communication so we looked at that just always remember what you've done in the lecture before because it helps you with your assessment okay yeah so today we'll be looking at um, session two, um, which is to do with communication skills and learning outcome two. And we'll be looking at uh, the different types of, sorry, uh, be able to interact orally with individuals in the health and social care setting. So anyone who's able to uh, interact orally with you. So that's the learning outcome two. So when we look at communication, uh, why do you think communication is so important uh, in the part of the care practice? Because without communication, we cannot send a message to another person. So communication yeah. is important every, for uh, running business or yeah. uh, contact with the people or society. So communication is very important for convey the message with the person you could uh, communication is important as well to understand anyone and and, and anyone others understand us yeah. obviously the communication yeah because it's very important that we're able to understand different people aren't we yeah. and we're able to also you know can you share ideas when you communicate with each other Do you think you can share ideas when you communicate with each other? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sharing ideas. Why is sharing ideas so important? For example, if I, take, um, 
sorry, it's okay. One at a time. Um, why do you think sharing ideas is very important? Knowledge and information. Information, knowledge, good, what else? Yeah. Yeah, it makes us to socialize and they ask questions, is that yeah. right choices, and to be supportive to others. Yeah, yeah, so you learn new things, you be supportive to others, and you're there to able to look, communicate different work roles as well. Yeah, and, and it's able to share ideas to encourage yeah. others. Share yeah, share ideas is so important because you're able to uh, uh, get the other person. Important. Sorry? Share ideas is very important because you're able to get the other person to understand what you're talking about. And yeah. you may give them an idea of what they're saying. Yes. Yes. I don't know what's going on with this screen. Is there some... Can you all see these screens, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So communication is not just about what we say verbally, but also about what we say through our actions, you know, what any body language, anything like that. Our yeah. bodies and faces can express how we are feeling and what we are saying in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So without using any words, see if you can use your body language and face to convey the following expressions and emotions. So you could you could be happy. How would you how would anyone be able to tell through emotions if you were happy? If you had a big smile on your face, could you uh, yeah. say that you're happy? Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you're anxious or if you're in pain as well or frightened, these are different ways of communicating it through actions as well. Yeah. People who yeah. work in the health and social care settings may communicate with the people they are caring for, with relatives and visitors, with colleagues and with practitioners from other care agencies and for a variety of different reasons. So there may be a patient that is not well and is dying. You may have to speak to their family, you know, so you have to show your emotions, you know, and you may have to speak to the relatives and tell them about what's going on. So yeah. you you are, you know, you have to show that you're uh, supportive, uh, you know, you're able to understand what they're feeling. So it's really, really important. That diagram on the side shows the different types of communication. So we've got verbal communication, which is face to face over yeah. the phone uh, through um, Skype or, or Zoom, chatting with um, with friends and family. Then you've got nonverbal communication, which is eye contact, body language, yeah. facial expressions, tone of the voice, the posture. And the gestures. Then you've got written communication, which is emails, reports, letters, manuals, telegrams, and then listening communication. So active listening uh, is uh, the key to you know any sort of communication. Visual communication, images, videos, uh, graphics, designs, visual presentations. So these are the ways that people learn and people understand different learners understand different ways, okay? Um, and the reason behind this is because, <laughs> excuse me, we all learn differently, okay? We all have a different, <laughs> excuse me, sorry about that. So we all have a different way of learning and, you know, people learn visually and orally. So using different styles and methods of oral communication to meet the needs of different individuals. So different types of communication. So practitioners working in the health and social um, care and early year setting need to be able to communicate in different ways with individuals and others, including their colleagues, other professionals, their work with uh, individual families and advocates. There are four types of communication skills that practitioners must be able to understand and use. Verbal, 
non-verbal, written and specialist. So, you know, when you're working in that environment, you need to be able to communicate to the level of that individual. So you might have, you know, relatives of the family. You may have, you know, doctors that you have to speak with in professional manner. You may have um, advocates from a different organisation that you need to speak to. So you need to really be able to speak in a communicate in a different environment. Verbal uh, skills are verbal or spoken communication pr can provide others with clues about who you are, how you are feeling. For example, practitioners who feel confident in their own abilities will tend to speak more clearly and positively than practitioners who don't. So confidence in, in some, some practitioners will speak more confident than others. Then you've got communicating with clarity involves sharing information with others clearly, accurately, and in a way that can be easily understood. So by pronouncing words clearly, not mumbling, and using words that are respectful. It's also being receptive to communi communications from others, listening attentively and confirming an understanding of what is expressed. So you can't talk to someone who's a professional in any slang language, can you? Or any sort of jargon that you use with your colleagues? No. You, no. Need, to, you need to pronounce the words properly. You need to speak in a professional manner and you need to be able to, uh, you know, get that person to understand what you're saying. Because in some instances, people don't understand certain words. And if we're using slang or we're using jargon, then they're going to think that we're not professional enough to deal with clients or deal with any sort of practitioners or advocates or any sort of um, um, uh, with any sort of family members or relatives. So there's six C of communication. The first one is courtesy. So show concern for intended receiver. Clarity is the second one. Compose messages that, that are easy to understand. Then we've got conciseness, which is state what needs to be said as in a few words as possible. Sometimes, you know, when we talk in so much words, we try and confuse the other person. So it's very, it's better to be brief and get the point across to that person. Uh, concreteness. So you convey a message in precise terms. Correctness, people provide accurate details in an acceptable format and completeness, so include all pertinent information. So, you know, correctness, you should be able to identify that you're, you know, if you're talking about someone's medication to a doctor or to the patient, you are correct in what you're saying. It's an accurate um, account of what you are saying because you can't give uh, wrong medication to a, uh, to a patient. So when we look at different types of communication, verbal communication, which is the differences in how you speak, including the tone, the pitch, the speed, and the volume of your voice could change how your messages are taken in. So can anyone give me an example of your tone and your pitch and how you talk, how, could, how, how someone would take a message, how someone would take your message? So if you talk, if you talk in a, clearly, calm. I yeah, calm. Why is it so important to be calm? So it will be easy to pass information between the two and yeah. get a proper understanding. Could you come? Could you come across if you're not calm and you're talking in a quite a high pitch? Could you come across as being quite aggressive? Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, you could come across as being aggressive. And if you're talking too fast and your volume is really loud, then, you know, you could come across as being not being able to understand what the person is saying. So try to avoid using jargon or abbreviations and complicated words and terminology. Why avoid using complicated words and legal, uh, sorry, uh, medical terminology? Will the person understand? No. No. So you have to try to put it across to them as, as basic as possible, but in a professional manner. 
make sure you always speak in a respect respectful way, adjusting your speech to the suit of the individual. So if you're talking to a patient um, and you're talking to a, a doctor, would you speak differently to both? Jessica, what do you think if you're talking to a patient who's quite old and you're speaking to them and talking about things, would you speak in a different way than you would talk to your colleagues? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Why is that important? Because obviously the pace is well. For elderly people, you should speak yeah. a bit slower because they might not understand. Yeah. You know? And if they've got like hearing problems and stuff, you know, they may not be able to hear what you're saying. Yeah. So, you know, you should speak in, in the basic terms, but also it, it be quite respectful because it's quite. Um, and, and then if you're speaking to a colleague and using slang and jargon, don't use that slang and jargon with this individual as well. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sign language. This is recognized language throughout the world. British Sign Language BSL is used by individuals in this country and there are variations of sign language in different regions. Um, and then they've got Makaton. This is a form of language that uses a large collection of signs and symbols. It's often used with those who have learning and physical uh, disabilities or hearing impairment. It's very important to use Makaton and things like sign language and a Braille because people with uh, disability, disabilities will be able to understand that. And that's what it's designed for. So Braille is a code, raised dots that are read using the torch for people who are visually impaired or who are blind. The system supports reading and writing for that individual. So it's really important we accommodate for that individual. Then we've got body language. So this is really important as we've discussed earlier as well, that you know the way you, your gestures, your face uh, expressions um, could um, amount to you being either you know upset or angry and things like that so your body language this is a type of non-verbal communication there are many different aspects of body language including gestures facial expressions eye contact body positioning and body movements um, each of these will communicate information about an individual or a worker often without them realizing it Gestures, uh, these are hand or arm movements that emphasize what is being said or used as an alternative to speaking. And that would be things like, you know, the sign language as well. Uh, facial expressions, these support what is being said by showing reactions or feelings. They can give you valuable clues that you must, you can use to check out a person's feelings. Do people sometimes take facial expressions the wrong way? Do you think sometimes, you know, um, some people's facial expressions are taken the wrong way? Maybe. I'm, I'm yeah. Sure. What if a person doesn't smile, you know, um, ever, to be mm -hmm. honest? Maybe they've got this kind of personality or their facial expressions don't show reactions. Can people take them? Can people be offended? Yeah, most definitely. Even yeah, sometimes, so. even sometimes, even with me. Yeah. Um, I would even get offended if some people some I wouldn't know, but some people might not show facial expressions. Even sometimes I would get offended. Yeah. So yeah, most definitely. It's true. I, I I would feel the same if someone has that, but sometimes someone's got that facial expression that doesn't change ever, you know, like a poker face. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's it's very difficult to identify what they're feeling. Yeah. Yes. Um and, and it's important because you know, like for example, um you know, in in court, because I teach law as well, in mm. court when you are um you are guilty, does your facial expression change? Um. It would, wouldn't it? If you are if you if you're identifying that you're not guilty, but your facial expression identifies that you are guilty. In yes. some instances that you know, does it can Sorry, get somebody through the face, like it, yeah. it can easily get what is happening to them through their facial expression. Yeah. 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 I think facial expressions is quite an important one. Sometimes yeah. it's quite hard to identify someone's facial expression. And it doesn't mean um what what was the name of the 
guy speaking before you, what's your name? Sorry. Uh, I don't even know your name. Oh, is it me? Yeah. What's uh, your name? David. 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 Sometimes, David, you know, you, you, it doesn't mean that the person is not smiling or is not is upset or anything. It, sometimes they have this constant expression on their face that, yeah. you know, they can't change. Um, yeah. but, but you're right. People do get offended by this. You know, yeah. the fact that, you know, facial expressions play quite an important role in, in communication. Yeah, yeah. Um, eye contact as well. Maintaining good eye contact is important for a health or social care worker to show they are engaged and listening. If you're looking around, are you concentrating on what the patient or the doctor is saying to you? No. Your eye contact is really important. So if you're not having no eye contact and you're just looking around, you're not really concentrating, are you? Yeah. Yeah, but no, is uh, but sometimes it's not always is a negative sign if you yeah. don't give up on chat. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah some people yeah. don't like giving eye contact all the time. Exactly, you know? in some cultures they don't just they don't do it. No, it's just you're right, totally right. I agree with you. In some cultures, it's very disrespectful to give too much eye contact. Yes, uh, because it's taken differently. Yeah. So you've got to take the cultural, uh, you know, uh, cultural um, ideas into in, in, into uh, you know perception. You've got to take them into order when you talk to someone because also in different cultures, people don't like to you know do certain gestures, which is handshakes and things. Yeah, that's so true. You you need to take these in the healthcare professional. Um, I will identify so within the Muslim community. Some men don't like to share um, uh, shake hands with a woman. You know exactly. Yeah, they they will say it's respectable to just say, um, "Hi, how are you?" Rather than sh giving a handshake. So you need to take yeah. all this into account when you have a patient. You need to take all these cultural views into account as well, um, and that you're not offending people because sometimes people are offended through that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Position. So the way we stand, sit, or hold our arms. <clears throat> When we are talking, we'll provide others with clues about our feelings, attitudes, and emotions. So if you stand there and your arms are crossed, sometimes it comes across, I'm a teacher. So if I stand there with my arms crossed, um, I will be, uh, the students will be thinking I'm mad. If I'm angry because I'm, lis I'm listening to them, but they're not listening to me. So if I cross my arms, it shows uh, some sort of authority as well that, you know, be quiet. You need to do the lecture. So, yeah. you know, these emotions, these positions we stand in, um, they do identify a lot of um, different feelings and attitudes and emotions. Mm -hmm. Written communication is sending messages, keeping records and providing evidence. Why is it so important um, to, to keep evidence of your written, uh, written um, records? For yes. future purposes. For future purposes, yeah, yes. because if if you if you are giving some medicine to a, a patient and you make an error and you've recorded a different medication and that person gets really ill and dies or mm. maybe you know is going into ICU, then you are liable. So this is you know where the fact of negligence is an issue. So you need to keep all records to identify that you've given the right. Uh, um, medication and not the wrong medication so keeping records is is uh to provide any sort of evidence as well yeah yeah and daily profile matter as well that we yeah. check how it feels now yeah 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 it's ex uh you need to provide these records so formal communication yeah. is likely to be used in the working environment particularly between you and the other workers informal communication is likely to be used with friends and families using familiar words or slang you should always use the communication method that is appropriate for the person and the situation so you should look at the person you are talking to you should look at the environment you are talking in you can't just use slang words when you're talking to a professional, an advocate, anyone, family members. You know, some sometimes you've got to look at the person and the environment um, and, and identify how I'm supposed to talk to this person. 
you know, uh, what manner I'm supposed to talk to them, how I'm supposed to, you know, if someone's um, upset because they've got family members in the hospital, you've got to be sympathetic, you've got to change your persona and be sympathetic to that person. And listen, listen is listening is the most important form of communication. And we've gone on I to have, listening now. I have one question, please. Yes. Uh, madam, uh, please tell me what is uh, the uh, language used for uh, hospital? Either is a formal language used or informal language used with patients? Depends. So formal can be used if you, you know, work is used in an environment where you're working with the doctors and different advocates from different organizations. And sometimes, you know, formal can be used for family members of uh, patients, but informal is your outside language. So if you're using slang or uh, different jargon with your friends or your family or your colleagues then that's different but mainly it should be formal that you should be using okay okay so to demonstrate appropriate listening skills so effective communication in a care settings helps both care workers and people who use uh, care services to form good relationships and to work well together. People communicate most effectively when they are feeling relaxed, are able to empathize with the other person, experience warmth and genuineness in a relationship. And effective communication also requires the care worker to develop and use range of skills, abilities and communication skills. As we've discussed earlier, it's really, really important. So here we've got a video which I'm going to put on and, and it'll identify the different types of active learning skills. If you can press this, let me just see if I can view. Maybe if I can right click into that. Can you all hear this, yeah? Can you hear this? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mrs. Is, is a video playing right now? Yes. Oh, sorry, I can't hear. The, I can't hear a video. I thought. I thought like you guys. I, I can't hear a video. Sorry. Can you? Can you all hear it? No, I can't I hear it. Uh, let's let's one minute. Let's see what's going on. Um, let's go back to this and we'll put it back on. Just can't see to Let's so new share. Uh, Uh, let's see, can you hear it now? Let's have a look, share this one. Share sound, maybe press that. Right. Can you hear it now? Yes. Can you hear it now, everyone, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Think about how much information you get every day from listening. Your boss, your colleagues, your clients, and your suppliers may communicate with you often. So will your family and friends. How much of what all these people say do you pay attention to? How much are you actually remembering from these conversations? Chances are, it's a lot less than you think. A lot of times we act as if we're listening to the other person, but the reality is that our minds are racing to other topics or already planning what we're going to say in return. This means that we can miss important things that the other person is saying. 
Active listening is when you make a conscious effort to hear and understand people so that you get the complete message. There are several things you can do to become an active listener. First, you need to pay attention. We know this is a bit obvious, but it's the most important part of active listening. For instance, make eye contact with the person talking to you. Ignore outside factors like other conversations so that you can focus solely on what the person is saying. Most importantly, put your own thoughts on hold. Resist the urge to start planning out what you're going to say in return. You also need to show the other person that you're listening to them. You can nod your head, smile, and say yes occasionally. All of these signals let the other person know you're still with them. Providing feedback on what the other person has just said is another important part of active listening. For instance, all of us hear information through our own personal filters and judgments. This can affect our understanding. To make sure you heard and understood the message correctly, paraphrase it or repeat it back to the person. You can also ask questions to get more information. But make sure that you listen to what they're saying before you plan your response. You also need to avoid interrupting when they are speaking. Once they're finished, you can respond appropriately and with an honest answer or opinion. Active listening is a skill that all of us should use more often. The better you are at listening, the more information you'll receive. This can pay off with big rewards in your career and strengthen your bonds with family and friends. You can find out more about active listening in the article that accompanies this video. So I stop sharing and let me go. So do you think... Um, you as an individual, uh, do you think that you um, do enough active learning? Do, do, you, do you think you listen more? Do you think you listen more? Do you think sometimes when you're talking to someone and the, the, it involves listening to that person, you sometimes think about other things at the same time? Yeah, boy, it's good to listen to someone when somebody is talking to you. So in case you need to ask questions about what the person was saying. But do you, do you always listen, though? Is there a time where you can get switched off? Yeah, 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 a lot of times, yeah, yeah, I, I do. I will be honest with you when I'm teaching something and the students are not listening in my class, uh, I sometimes get switched off as well. And yeah. if it, if you don't actively listen, then you're not listening to what they're thinking about, you're thinking about the next class. So, you need to really, really be listening when it comes to active listening, you know, yeah. and understand. And when you sit down with a patient or a client, you need to be there to listen to them properly so you know that you're not thinking about the next uh, step to take. Yeah, exactly. So can you see these slides now, everyone, yeah? yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the next one is the solar model of uh, communication that people use. Um, the solar model of communication developed by G Gerard Egan and based on the approaches used in counselling. Um, the solar model of um, communication shows how active listening can be demonstrated to others. So it's really, really important that we, you know, try to use these different models that are acquired by us. Um, so the S in solar is to sit squarely in relation to the person. This demonstrates that you are ready to listen. Open, the O in solar is to open position. Open body language indicates more attentive listening. This means not folding your arms. Also sometimes shaking your head and eye contact is really important as well. Um, the L in solar is to lean slightly towards the person to whom you are listening. This indicates that you are interested in what the other person is saying. Eye contact. Maintain good eye contact. I know some of you were saying in certain cultures you can't maintain certain eye contact, but you can nod your head and say, yes, you are listening. OK, and the R in uh, solar is to relax. It's important to still sit still without fidgeting as this can distract the other person. If you are fidgeting, um, th is the other person relaxed? Oh, it distracts 
So if you if you're fidgeting and playing with your fingernails and just fidgeting, is the other person you are talking to gonna feel relaxed? No. No, no. Uh, no. they're gonna be a bit worried, aren't they? Sorry, what's yeah. that? thought someone said something they're going to be a bit worried aren't they because they're going to be just thinking this person is anxious and nervous so you know i feel anxious and nervous as well so be relaxed so active listening um a person who uses active listening pays close attention to what the other person is saying and notices the non-verbal messages they are communicating People who are good in active listening also tend to be skilled at using minimal prompts. These are things like nods of your head, like I said, mm, mm. like that the sounds, mm, sounds, and encouraging words like yes, I see, or go on. Uh, skillful use of meaningful uh, prompts encourages the person to keep speaking or to say a little more. So an example I'll give you is uh, Eileen Morgan has worked in a preschool nursery for 15 years. During this time, she has developed good relationships with the children she cares for. Students who come to the nursery on work placement eventually notice that the children really like to talk to Eileen. This is uh, partly because Eileen listens more than she talks when she's interacting with a child. Eileen is always very encouraging when a child comes to speak to her. She smiles a lot, focuses on their face, but also notices what they are doing. She says this helps her understand what the child is feeling. She gives each child plenty of time to talk, staying quiet when the child pauses and uses sounds like, mm, uh -huh, and little phrases like, I see, that's good, and tell me more to encourage them. How is Eileen, now this is a question to you lot, after reading the Eileen scenario, how is Eileen using active skills when she interacts with children at the nursery? What does she do? How is she using her active skills? And her, sorry, how is she, from that scenario, how is she using her active listening skills when she uh, interacts with the children? Does she listen to them? Yeah. She listens to them. She communicates with them. And what does Eileen try to notice when a child is doing when they, she, they are talking? Uh, <clears throat> they tend to make those noises. Yeah. And and sometimes that helps her. And, you know, and, and she she's able to, you know, um, talk to them and see what they're doing. And yeah. give example of minimal prompts used by Eileen to encourage. What kind of minimal prompts did she use? She used is, mm, I yeah. see, uh, you know, that's good, tell me more. So these are kind of things, you know, you shouldn't, the other thing is a lot of people tend to have sessions with children or with maybe patients or anything. You shouldn't rush people. Because if you're not, if you're rushing people, do they get everything across to you? Do you think you're a good active le listener if you're rushing? No. No, 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 not at all. No. So you need to be no. listening to them. You need to be, you know, consoling them. You need to be making them feel, um, feel like you're listening and you're paying attention because attention is really important. So, you know, yeah. you need to nod your head. You need to make these prompts to identify that you're a good listener. Yeah. Listening and yeah. attending are by far the most important aspects of a healthcare professional. Everyone needs to be listened to. If we can listen to someone, we can really help them. Curiously, some people don't consider listening as a communication. To them, it seems odd that the part of communication involves being quiet. But listening is vital to good communication. And I believe that 100%. I think it's very important. Attending it is the act of truly focusing on the other person. You know, some people feel like, you know, they don't have anyone to speak to. So active listening is really important. It involves consciously making ourselves aware of what a person is saying and what they are trying to communicate to us. It is concerned with 
our attention. So it really, you know, you as a teacher, I will go back to my experience as a teacher. If I have students that come to see me for any sort of issues at home or any sort, and I do listen a lot and I try and prompt them and say, tell me more. And I, I you know, try and get all the story out of them because sometimes people from different cultures don't want to talk to other people about their problems. So it does kind of cause a bit of a rift culturally. But if you can sit down and make them feel welcome and be more attentive, then they will try and speak more to you. So yes. it's really, really important. You know, some people, especially uh, I get, I uh, have been teaching for the last 16 years. I do get the experience from um, older Asian men. They don't like uh, females to teach them. So, you know, culturally, uh, we've had issues with, you know, females uh, teaching men. Uh, but um, if you sit down and speak to them and feel make them feel more welcome, they're able to listen and able to identify certain things. So it's really the person who talked about earlier on about the cultural things. I think it's really important because it does impact on certain people, you know, the eye contact and things like that. So you should be you should be respectful to people's cultures, but also respectful to the person sat there as well. I mean, I don't know how some of you feel about that. Do you think sometimes culture restricts you from doing certain things? Yeah, but I think it's about the individual, you know, because presentation is very important. Yeah. I think sometimes they do get drawn to talking, you know, if they feel, if they feel you know, welcomed, but they feel that, like you're listening to them, then they're able to, you know, tell you everything. Yes. And that you're paying attention. So, you know, it's really important in regards to that. Yeah. Uh, aspects of listening. So we've got ling linguistic aspects of speech. So this refers to the actual words and phrases used. Paralinguistics, which refers to all aspects of speech that are not words. The timing, the tone you speak in, the volume, the pitch and the accent. Sometimes the accent does uh, have an impact um, on understanding certain things. Um, non-verbal aspects of communication, body language, uh, facial um, facial expression, again, gestures, uh, the position you move in, the body position, the movement, the proximity to others, and sometimes touch, you know, the touch, you know, the handshake, like we said, or the tap on the uh, shoulder. Mm. Behavioral aspects to listening. So sit squarely. If you sit squarely in relation to the patient, or the relative, maintain an open position so you're able to lead slightly towards the person and make the person feel welcome. Maintain reasonable eye contact with the person and then relax. Relax is really, really important. You know, sometimes in your skill that you have eye contact and attention, but minimal prompts, yes, uh, go on, head nodding, um, the open questions, how are you feeling? Uh, would you like a drink? These kind of things. Communications. Uh, so you are important, I'm still listening, I'm interested, concerned. So these are things that you need to get across to the individual. Uh, blocks to effective listening. So there's always blocks to any sort of thing you do and effective listening. So healthcare professionals own problems, the health professional stress and anxiety, uh, feel you do not have the enough time. Sometimes you rush things. It's awkward and uncomfortable seating. Lack of attention to listening behavior, value judgments and interpretations on behalf of the healthcare professional, aids to effective listening, so attention, suspension of judgment by the healthcare professional, attention to the behavior aspect of listening, avoidance of interpretation, and sen sensible use of minimal pro uh, prompts. So um, the use use appropriate methods, including technology and other aids to present information orally. So there's communication aids. Technology has enabled an increasing number of electronic and digital aids um, to communicate that can help people who have difficulty speaking. So many of the devices enable messages to be recorded and stored and played at touch of a button. Um, the devices range in sophistication and price information, advice and guidance on choosing the most suitable devices is available from speech and language therapists to whom a referral can be made within the NHS. 
Um, so, you know, if anyone's uh, deaf or anyone's got hearing issues or difficulty speaking, any speech impairment, you would provide communication aids for that individual. Um, manage and facilitate a question and answer sessions to demonstrate subject knowledge and assess effectiveness of your own oral communication skills. Here, you need to conduct a question and answer session. Uh, with the tutor to obtain information. So the primary function of a question is to gain information. So what time is it? To help maintain control of a conversation. So while you are asking questions, you are in control of that conversation. Assertive people are more likely to take control of conversations, attempting to gain the information they need through questioning. Uh, express an interest in the other person. So again, you know, show that you are interested in what they are saying. So questioning allows us to find out more about the respondent. This can be you. This can be useful when uh, attempting to build a rapport between you and the individual, and to empathy, or to simply get to know the other person better. And they have um, uh, building rapport and empathy links on there that you could go into to clarify a point. So questions are commonly used in communication to clarify something that the speaker said. Questions used as clarification are essential in reducing misunderstanding and therefore more effective communication. You need to try and move away from that misunderstanding. Here's uh, um, the 2D1 criteria, the observation record sheet. So the learner's name, the qualification, the unit title, the assignment title, description of the observation. So what happened and what occurred? Assessment criteria, the judgment of whether the activity meets the standards for the assessment criteria and the assessor's name and the signature. So this identifies you know, the criteria for an observation record sheet in regards to how things are dealt with. Okay, so the next slide is all the references that have been used. Um, towards completing uh, this learning outcome uh, two, okay? So next week, you will be doing learning outcome three on the Friday, and you will be doing the, uh, uh, the assignment discussion on the Saturday, and it's at the same time, 11 o'clock. Has anyone got any questions before we finish uh, learning outcome two today? Uh yeah, sorry. So when do we actually start getting the work, like proper online work to start doing? Is it like the week after that? I think they're on, it's all on Moodle. Have you got access to Moodle? Um, no, no. Oh, you, you need to contact that learner learner um, email address on, online. All right. Um, and co contact them and, and you need to have access. Has everyone got access to Moodle? Oh, mm. yes. Yes, some of you have and some of you haven't. You need to contact that learner work, the varsity one, and email them and tell them you need access to Moodle, David. Right. Um, because you need to be getting on to Moodle, getting your resources from Moodle. Also, these videos are recorded on Moodle and you need to be able to uh, start doing the assessments because um, next week you will have the last learning outcome, which is learning outcome three on the Friday and Saturday is the assignment discussion. Um, and then you would be having to work through the assignment. So then this session on communication will end then. All right. All right. Then, yeah, I'll definitely. So you, need to, you need to contact them to get access onto Moodle. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Yeah, I will. Okay. Has yeah. anyone got any other questions? No. Anyone no. got any questions about the slides or any sort of resources? Everything for you is on Moodle, okay? So you oh. have got access uh, to Moodle um, to get all your sources and things like that. And what we'll do now is we'll, uh, you've got on here, on the back of it, you've got some references that you can look at in your own time, but there's additional support on Moodle as well. So I will see you lot next week in your Friday session at 11 o'clock. And then the last session is on Saturday at 11 o'clock. Is that okay, everyone? Yeah, all right then. Thank you okay. so much. See you all later, right. David. Uh, the one that can't get onto Moodle, please contact uh, UK Varsity on the learner work yeah. and you'll be able to get onto Moodle then, okay? All right then, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have all a right. nice week, everyone. All right, you too. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hi, everyone.